Aloha Kako. I'd like to welcome you to live from New World Lab at Gemini. My name is Jamika. I'm an outreach assistant here at the International Gemini Observatory, a program of NSF's NOR Lab here in beautiful Hilo, Hawaii. Before introducing today's host and special guest scientist, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items. As you'll note, you are joining us via YouTube Live. Throughout the presentation, you may type in any questions in the live chat. We do have our moderator, outreach assistant, Alyssa Leinani Grace, who will read and or post the questions for our host and science guests to answer, to answer. So as those questions pop in your mind, as you're listening to our host and guests, please feel free to go ahead and add them into the chat. Also, please be aware that there is a 15 to 30 second lag time for the live stream. So we appreciate your understanding and patience. Okay, on with the show. Today's host is Peter Michaud. Peter leads the communications, education, and engagement team for Gemini Observatory. He's worked at Gemini for over 20 years and before that taught astronomy and planetariums from the East Coast to Honolulu. Our special guest uh, scientist today is Andre Nicola Chenet. Andre earned his PhD in astrophysics from the Université de Montréal. He's worked as a research associate in Victoria, Canada, then as a postdoctoral fellow in Chile for a few years before joining Gemini Observatory in early 2013. His main scientific interests include massive stars and young stellar open clusters. Okay, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Jamika, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, again, from Hilo, Hawaii, where the uh, Gemini North Telescope is located here on the big island of Hawaii. Um, what I'd like to do is start off by uh, giving a little background information on the Gemini Observatory and some of the things that, uh, that make us unique in the world of astronomy. And, um, so we'll move forward and take a look at a little time lapse here of the Gemini North Telescope here in Hawaii on Mauna Kea. Uh, this is a time lapse at night by the full moon and you can see uh, the telescope looking at different parts of the sky and the Milky Way passing over right now in that, uh, in that view. Going inside and taking a look at the telescope. Uh, the telescope's about seven stories high, just to give you, you a need sense. need to share screen. Oops, I'm sorry. Thought I was. <laughs> Okay, why is that not sharing? Excuse me for a second here. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, We'll go through, go through that again. Uh, this is the uh, Gemini North Telescope up on Mauna Kea, time-lapse showing it through the course of a night. And you can see the Milky Way going up over top of it now. Um, and um, now we're gonna go inside and take a look at the telescope. The telescope's about seven stories tall. Uh, so it's a big structure. The mirror itself, uh, which is down at the bottom of that is eight meters across, about 27 feet. Uh, so we collect a lot of light from the sky and we're looking at the night here by moonlight. And you can see that the sky is actually blue at night. Uh, you don't normally see that because the eye is not sensitive enough to see the color of the sky by moonlight. But um, in the time exposure like this, the time-lapse exposure like this, you can see. And now the moon is setting and the moon was full. So now the sun's rising and we go back to where we started there. Um, this is Mauna Kea, by the way, uh, looking at it from Mauna Loa. And we'll, we'll talk a little um, geography here in a few minutes. Um, but um, you can see one of the features that you see when you look at Mauna Kea during the day as time goes by is that the clouds tend to stay at a certain level and don't get too much higher than that most of the time. There are exceptions to that, of course, about 9,000 feet up. And so the top of the mountain at about 14,000 feet uh, stays nice and clear, dry and dark uh, as nighttime comes on here and the moon comes up again. Uh, uh, we can see uh, the nice clear skies and at night those clouds actually sink down 
a little bit lower and um, you know, give a nice pristine clear view of the sky. So that's a little bit of what it looks like on the mountain. Um, let's talk about where the two Gemini telescopes are located on the Earth. Uh, one of them out here in the middle of the Pacific, uh, Gemini North on Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii, and the other is in Chile. And so collectively, those two, the two telescopes can see both sides of the equator. We can see the entire sky, but let's zoom in a bit more on the Hawaiian island chain, since that's where we're coming to you from today. The big island is the big one on this picture off to the right, the lower right. And if we zoom in on that, uh, you can see some features here that are kind of interesting, in two, including two white blobs in the, near, on either side of the middle of, of the island. The one near the top is snow on the top of Mauna Kea, and then the one uh, below that is on Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa tends to be a, a, a oh, not quite, it's a, it's a shallower, uh, more gradual um, peak. And so the snow actually looks more extensive there, uh, but they're both uh, very nearly the same height. Mauna Loa is a few hundred feet lower than Mauna Kea, uh, but Mauna Kea is the one on the top, and yes, we do have snow in Hawaii, and that's uh, we'll take a closer look at that in a few moments. Um, one more, <clears throat> more feature you can see on this image is down uh, towards the lower right, um, a red glow down there. <clears throat> that's because when this image was taken, the uh, la lava was flowing. Uh, we have one of the world's most active volcanoes here on the big island, Kilauea. Um, currently, it's not, uh, not doing very much, but several years ago, it was very active and was for the last 30 years or so. Um, and in fact, you may recall that there was uh, quite an extensive lava flow about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> and uh, caused a lot of damage. And so the Big Island has is uh, um, geologically very interesting. Uh, lots of things going on here on the Big Island. Um, our headquarters uh, on the Big Island are here in Hilo. Um, it rains a lot in Hilo. And you think, well, if it rains so much, why, why would you build astronomical observatories on the Big Island? Well, the rain falls on Hilo, but by the, the time the, the air has moved up the mountain, it's all, the, all the moisture has been wrung out basically over the Hilo side of the island. And it's nice and dry and clear on the mountain most of the time. Of course, not all the time, but most of the time. Um, this our headquarters is also where we do remote observations uh, um, and so most of the observations that we make are done from our control room in Hilo and you can also see out front there are um, several flags from the international partnership that make up the the observatory um, the twin Gemini telescopes, like I said, are located on both sides of the equator. Now, this is not to scale, obviously, but one in Chile and one in Hawaii. And collectively, they can see the sky uh, from both hemispheres. And we can see the entire night sky between the two telescopes. The mirrors, like I said, are eight meters across, about 27 feet across. And they're um, essentially identical, except some of the instruments are different that we use on the, on the two telescopes. But um, um, the advantage is by having two telescopes on each side of the equator, we can see the entire sky. This is the Gemini South Telescope here um, on a particularly uh, pretty sunset. Uh, normally astronomers don't like to see clouds like this at sunset, but uh, these clouds actually dissipated and went away and it was a clear night after those, after those clouds went away. But uh, um, it's on a mountain called Cerro Pachon in Chile, a particularly uh, striking location uh, in Chile. Um, this time lapse, I, I showed a, a, a smaller version of this earlier, but this is uh, again showing one day looking at Mauna Kea uh, and watching what happens in the atmosphere. And you can see the clouds forming as the island heats up, the clouds get a little bit thicker um, and a little bit more prevalent. Off to the right is Hilo in this image and it's probably raining in Hilo at about that time. Uh, but as the sun goes down and the island cools, um, and in this case, the moon's gonna come up to show us what's happening. Um, those clouds tend to sink down um, and again, keep the top of the mountain clear, dry, and very stable. One of the nice things about Mauna Kea being in the middle of the Pacific is the air is very, very stable. And so we get uh, very good um, 
um, resolution or very good clarity of objects in the sky because there isn't a lot of turbulence in the air overhead. Um, getting back to the geology though of, of the Big Island, uh, again, we do have um, a lot of volcanoes, uh, acti uh, volcanic activity here with Kilauea. Also Mauna Loa has uh, been active um, and uh, its last activity was in 1984 as a matter of fact and the lava uh, got to within about five miles of, of Hilo here on the Big Island. So. Um, it is an issue. Uh, however, on Mauna Kea, the, uh, it's been about 4,500 years since there's been any active volcanoes. And so nowadays you're more apt to see something like this, which is one of the winter snowstorms on the mountain. This is from a webcam uh, that points towards Gemini. You can monitor this if you go to the just Google Mauna Kea webcams and you'll see views like this. And when we get one of these winter storms, it can get a little bit extreme. Uh, there are times when the snow drifts can reach 10, 15 feet deep. Uh, oftentimes after a storm like this, the atmosphere can get very clear. And so astronomers will be very, uh, very anxious to get back on the sky. But if you look carefully at this image, you can see that there's snow up on the dome and you really don't want to open the dome and there's snow and ice on it because it can fall down on the telescope. So we have to get all of that cleared away. And uh, once all the snow is cleared away and the snow blowers have come in to allow people to come to the telescope and, and uh, check up on all the instruments and whatnot, uh, then we can get back on the sky and, and uh, observe again. Um, after, even after a snowstorm like this. We also have other extreme weather, um, especially in the winter time. Um, we can get winds 100 or even more miles per hour. Um, it happens a couple times a year often. And uh, so um, we do have to deal with uh, some, some inclement weather at times, but about 80% of the time we get uh, conditions where we can observe the sky uh, in very uh, exquisite uh, conditions. Um, now, if you go down a little bit, down closer to sea level, uh, you can see we get into more of the tropical climate, uh, and it's quite a um, contrast when you're in a tropical climate um, looking up at snow on the mountain. Um, and this is a, an example of what you might see in January or February, looking up towards Mauna Kea from down in some of the pasture lands down below. Um, but on clear nights, which again is most of the time, uh, this is what it would look like as you're, um, if you were at the telescope, uh, looking up at the sky and uh, the vent gates on the side are open, the observing slit is open and we're getting ready to observe. Andre Nikolai, who is with us, has um, a lot more experience up on the mountain making observations. And so maybe Andre, you could tell us a little bit about um, what it's like when we're getting the telescope set to observe the sky. Sure, yes. So that's uh, the moment why one, more than 150 people are working every, all the day, all day uh, to make happen, uh, to make sure everything is aligned and ready for. Um, so to open the dome and open the vent gates uh, all around me right now, um, um, you, um, um, before you do that, uh, you have to have everything ready. So the instruments are um, all cool and ready. Uh, the systems are all up and running and the staff uh, behind the desk ready to observe. Um, the dome is there to protect the telescope uh, from, from the weather conditions. So we want it well closed and, and, and in good shape. Um, so, um, but when we open the, uh, the, 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 the slit and the vent gates, um, we don't want all that air to flow from inside to outside. So to prevent uh, so much air motion, uh, we're climatizing the air inside of the dome during the day. And we aim for a temperature that is the one predicted for when we will open the dome. And we open the dome um, around sunset. So when the sun is disappearing, we open everything up. We let the last few degree difference uh, uh, disappearing. So uh, when it's time to observe, which is about 15 minutes later, uh, everything is balanced and everything is ready up and running. In the 15 minutes we have between when we open and when we can start observing, 
we have to uh, race uh, against the time to have everything calibrated. We uh, look at the bright star, making sure that everything is aligned on focus. We have everything calibrated. We, have, um, we can even start some first standard observations. And then we start uh, as soon as, it, as it's dark enough. And we go for the night and try to uh, optimize that time to make the, the most science we can in the night before the sun comes back again and we have to close. Oh, thank you, thank you, Andre Nikolai. You caught me uh, having a little snack here. Sorry. Anybody like spam musubi? <laughs> um, well, great discovery yeah. from when I moved to Hilo, I have to say. <laughs> uh, okay, let me put sharing back on again here and um, take a look at a few more slides. Andre Nikolai will be right back with us in a moment um, to talk about uh, some of the work that he does. Um, let's see here. There we go. And so if you are outside the dome looking at it, uh, looking at the sky, um, you might see something like this. However, you wouldn't see the dome quite like this. This, uh, this photograph was taken by a number of individual frames as the, as the dome rotated. And so it sort of painted a picture of the open slit uh, in the interior of the telescope and sort of made the dome go away. So this is what the, what the telescope would look like if half of the dome were, were gone and you could see the telescope sitting uh, at the observatory at night. Um, so I wanna focus on a topic now, a special topic for today's program that Andre Nikolai is, is, is especially um, knowledgeable about is about an instrument called GRACES, which is a long acronym, actually it's an acronym within an acronym, and so I won't go into the acronym, but it's a very unique instrument uh, or, or setup where we take the light from the Gemini Observatory and we use a fiber optic cable to take it to that telescope in the background there, that white telescope called the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. The Canada-France Hawaii Telescope has a mirror that's about three and a half meters across. So it's a big telescope and a, 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 a wonderful, great telescope that uh, has produced an awful lot of amazing science. But Gemini has an eight meter mirror, so we can collect more light. And so what we've done is we've worked out a, a, an arrangement where the light from Gemini goes over via fiber optic cable to the Canada-France Hawaii telescope to use one of the spectrographs over there. And so Andre Nikolai, why don't you go ahead and tell us, Andre Nikolai, by the way, was the one who uh, led this effort to build this instrument that, that allowed these two telescopes to work so well together. Yeah, absolutely. So the big questions we had to ask is how can we have such a great uh, spectrograph, which is the instrument uh, that is GRACES, without having to pay the full price for getting a new one? Uh, you have to understand that the minimum cost for such an instrument is about $5 million. But more realistically, if you um, take into account all the expenses, it's more in the $10 million. So um, for the for about 15 times less of that price, if not 20, depending on how you calculate that, um, we could get the same results because the Canada France Hawaii already own a fantastic spectrograph, extremely efficient with high resolution, exactly what we wish we had. And ideally we would have brought that spectrograph over, but they, but they like it and they want to continue using it. Um, so that's how um, we decided to work in collaboration. And that's one great example of how observatories can work together on Mauna Kea. Uh, and Canada Friends Hawaii is, is especially a great, uh, a great group of people to work with. Uh, they are always excited by, uh, by science and, and discoveries and innovation. So the big challenge was then to carry the light from the Gemini side and bring it over to the CFHT side, which is about 250 meter away from one another. So uh, of course, one may say, well, an optical uh, cable, uh, an optical fiber is the obvious sensor. Yes, it is. Yet uh, never in the past before this instrument was that ever achieved. The reason for that, I mean, the reasons for that are multiple. First of that is uh, for a long time, the fibers were not of high quality enough to achieve such 
a challenge. So when you produce your fiber, it's a, it's a long stretch of uh, fiber, but that is very, very uh, small. It's about the size of uh, thick hair, let's say. And, it, and when the light goes through, it has to go through pure glass. If there's any little stress or any little grain or anything in the way, the light will be lost. So you need a perfect fiber all the way from one end to the other. On top of that, you have to figure a way, figure out a way to put it between the two telescopes without stretching it, without wrapping it. I don't know if you had to wrap a cable, like an electric cable or any, uh, any sort of thing like that. It can become very challenging as it tends to twirl and, and twist. So you had to keep the, the fiber perfectly stable and all flat all the way through along this huge distance between the two telescopes. Also noting down that you have to go to the fifth floor on, this, on the Gemini side, uh, down to the basement of the CFHT in the middle of, uh, of, of the dome. And I don't know if you can hear me <laughs> because some neighbors are doing a great demonstration. <laughs> So, you want me to take it for a little bit? No, I, I just want to say that the time I had to stop speaking is about um, uh, the time that it took for that motorcycle to uh, go across the same distance the fiber is going through. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, when we first plugged the whole thing, um, we didn't know what to expect. So, the, the tube that you see on this image on the far, um, I think you, it should display on your far right. Um, this was already in place because there was already a previous idea for connecting the two uh, telescopes. And uh, GRACES was the first opportunity for, for doing it. Um, so I said a lot about the installation. Let's, let's see the crucial moment when we installed that fiber. So uh, Peter will help me and go through all the steps for making that uh, video appear. So you now see you see uh, John White, optical engineer uh, at Gemini, also mechanical and electrical, he knows everything basically. And what you're seeing now is a white string that goes all across from CFHT, where we're at CFHT right now, all the way to Gemini. And he's holding right now some weights that are protecting the end of the fiber because the end of the fiber are critical. This is the surface where the light will uh, come in. So you're now entering the conduit between the two telescopes. Um, that's the dirt. Uh, it's at the top right now. The, the dirt is the bottom of the, pipe, the pipeline. So you'll see that as we're pooling, this is uh, 2,000 times faster than reality. It took for a long time to do that. We're going across this whole pipeline. It was pulled very slowly. Make sure not to stretch the cable, not to twist it. So you'll see it's staying pretty, pretty steady. It doesn't twist that much. It doesn't twirl that much. Maybe at some times, but not too much. And now that we're at normal speed, we're exiting on the other side, on the CF, on the Gemini side. And this is Eduardo Tapia, other very uh, important uh, engineer uh, at Gemini, carefully pulling out the end. And now the fiber is being pulled all the way from the CFHT side to the Gemini side. Here's Cooper, also helping out very, uh, uh, making, uh, crucial manipulation for this installation. So, and we don't want that, <laughs> that video to run. Um, so, yeah, so. Um, Welcome back friends and family of my audience. Greetings if you've never. Yeah, there you go. Um, so that was critical. If that did not go well, uh, it would have compromised the whole project. Now the light, so when we plugged the cable for the first time, we had to look at both ends, seeing if everything would go clear. And what we saw on the CFHC side was a very clean and pure light that was coming straight from the Jimmy side, which was very uh, exciting for us. It was the very first time such a long fiber could carry the light with all the beam information that is crucial for injecting into the instrument and getting the critical astronomical data. Whoops, <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> So uh, Peter, I think, uh, are you going back to? Um... 
So yeah, the, the beauty of YouTube is it, it, it will always suggest you a video that is relevant with what you just saw. <laughs> but it's because Gracious is so unique, you will never get any video that is close enough from it. <laughs> So I think, Peter, you need to go uh, bring back the keynote. Yeah, I will do that. Let's see here, keynote. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Andre Nicola, it looks like we have a question for you from the YouTube chat. Jenny Berkuis wants to know, how does that last turn affect the fiber info quality? What is that last turn? Impact the light quality? How does asking. it affect the light quality? So what would have happened with the installation failed is, um, is the fiber to be pinched. So the key for the fiber was to protect it with a very, very strong uh, wrapping, very strong and rigid. Um, so would the installation have failed, the fiber inside the protection would have bundled and touched the side. And if the cable had twisted or, or made a loop or anything of that sort, it would risk uh, one place to pinch or even uh, um, stretch or have marks. Any sort of contact like this would eventually make um, uh, the light to uh, leave the trajectory. And instead of staying al along the fiber, it would go straight outside and then hit the, the protector instead of continuing its way. Um, also, I think um, it's safe to say that any curves or the radius of any curves that the fiber makes are very gradual so that it doesn't bend exactly. a lot over a short distance, right? So that exactly. you don't get any kinks that way too, yeah. Exactly, so there are a couple turns and a couple bends. Um, the, the, the protector itself prevents any, um, any loop that is smaller than a quarter of a meter or something like that. Um, so that's way within the, the limits that is allowed by the fiber. Uh, would you force it? Uh, you would have to put a lot of force. You may break that minimum, but so far the, the, the protector was made so it would follow all those turns and those, um, and those um, um, little bends without going beyond the limit of what is allowed for the, fit, for the, for the cable to bend. And if I can add also, Andre Nikolai, the, the um, throughput of the fiber is, is very high and higher than was anticipated, correctly? correct? Yes, um, that's, that's exactly true. So the expectations was that, um, were that such a long fiber would eat up a lot of the light because across the way, the light, even though the fiber is very pure, it would uh, have to go through the glass and the glass would absorb some of it. It is actually the case when you mention the blue light, the bluer light is absorbed more than half or about. On the red light, uh, we were very, very shocked to see that not only it's not very much absorbed, but it, 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 it feels like it's merely absorbed at all. Um, and if you look at on, the, uh, on the red light, um, it's almost as if the spectrograph was sitting at the Gemini telescope. It's as if the 270 meter fiber itself was invisible, which is great, a great achievement. Plus, if you take into account that the mirror Gemini is silver, then we get even more red light. So, uh, so Grace's, which is using the CFHC spectrograph, uh, but with a mirror a Gemini, is even better uh, than just uh, scaling up the CFHT mirror to the same size if you're observing in the red light. If you're observing in the blue light, you better go to CFHT though. So we made possible a certain type of observation that is uh, nowhere to find uh, any equivalent or very few places where you would find the equivalent. What we're displaying right now is a system, one of the first systems that was observed with GRACES. Uh, in the middle, you have a big star showing a lot of spots and flares surrounded by a planet uh, that looks a little bit like Jupiter, but with a thicker disk. 
Andrea Nicola, can I just interject? Uh, this is artwork, by the way. This is not an actual image of, of an object. That's space. very important. <laughs> yeah, it's an artwork. Um, while you're there, would you remind me? Oh, yeah, the name is V830 Tau. And um, it's a very interesting uh, observation because this star is in formation right now. It's merely. That is not the sound of, of a forming star, <laughs> but it's about as turbulent as this motorcycle. Um, it's merely two million year old, and you have spots on it and flares and a lot of things going on. At the same time, you have this planet orbiting it. And when you observe it from the ground, you don't see that many details. And this is why we had to ask an artist to reproduce what it should look like. All you see is that just a single spot of light and then we, with graces, you try to um, uh, use the, the information from the uh, instruments to isolate all the information. What the um, science team had to do was to isolate all the signal coming from all those dark spots, all those flares, and everything that is happening on the star, remove that, and then tiny, tiny was the signal of that Jupiter-like planet near it. Once they could get that signal, what they found was the distance between that planet and the star was very, very small. That answered a very critical answer uh, question. The question was, how much time does it take for a planet like Jupiter to migrate from outward where it was formed when, the, when everything was formed very early in the, in the process? and when it migrates inward uh, closer to the host star. Because this star is only 2 million year old, having that planet so close to it gives us the answer that at least in that case and possibly in most cases, that migration happened almost immediately, which means that this is caused by friction that is happening between the, the forming planet, because that big Jupiter planet is still very young, and all the material around it and this brings it closer to the star. Uh, the other possibility was that it would stay far and wait for other planets to be formed and with interaction with the other planets, this would make it migrate. This seems to be less likely than what we're observing right now. So it's an early migration caused by uh, friction with all the viscous material around it. So that was a big groundbreaking discovery that was possible very early on the, um, Grace's life. On the next slide, there's another uh, system that was revealed by Graces. So you're getting the answer. Uh, the answer is this was a system of a white dwarf with surrounded by, um, I mean, orbiting with a uh, red giant. The red giant was giving, oh, it's material. And then it eventually exploded in a supernova. So when the supernova exploded, you can see that white dwarf being completely ejected from the system. And it's ejected at such a high speed that it went past us at such a speed that we know it's a speed that is high enough to eventually escape our Milky Way. So the first observations were showing that this was a high speed white dwarf. We didn't know where it was coming from, but observation with graces allowed us to analyze all the elements that uh, constrain the possibilities into that one system that exploded right now, yeah. Uh, so it, it was such a massive and powerful explosion that it really ejected the white dwarf as if it was a gun bullet. And um, luckily it went close to us, so we had time to catch it before it escapes in a couple thousands of years from now, it will eventually escape our Milky Way. So those were two early groundbreaking discoveries made very soon after we made Graces possible uh, because we were offering to the community a new way to look at the universe. We're now changing gears. completely different. Yeah, we're now for something completely different. We're changing gears here. So it's not so much uh, graces related anymore. This is more uh, the research I'm, I'm, I'm working on right now. Um, as uh, Jamika mentioned earlier, I'm interested on massive stars and, and star clusters. So let me explain to you what, I, what, what they are and why they are important to me. So what you're seeing here is um, a class, uh, class picture of kindergartners. 
um, and I label them as young star clusters. Essentially, why I mean, what I mean there is the same way um, stars, um, when you see them all together, they're a bit like a classroom. In a classroom, you have uh, kiddos that are all pretty much at the same age, and they pretty much all come from the same area. So if there's anything different between them, it is not because they have, they have different age, and it is not because they come from a different place. And they tend to be from the same species, uh, of course, uh, also to mention. So if uh, you can uh, make the next image appear. In comparison in the universe, um, we have groups of stars. When we see them all together, uh, they make us think of uh, the same thing as, as this classroom. So what you're seeing here is the cluster NGC 6520. That uh, cluster is the, is the bluer stars that you're seeing uh, in the foreground. In the background, all the yellow stars are far, far away from the cluster. They, are, they belong to the, the galaxy bulge, and uh, they are much older stars uh, that are not part of, uh, of the clusters. In the foreground, we're having all the, a crown of blue stars all around uh, a bright yellow star in the center. Those are all the stars that belong together in the same group. They are the same age. They come from the same area. They are all at the same distance from us. This is really crucial for us uh, to have access to. So we can study them. Um, so if I compare those stars one with one another, they all have different brightness. Different brightness means that they are uh, physically different. Um, so, uh, um, so what it means there is they, they, they have a different mass. And the one in the center is yellow and bright. Why is it not blue like the others? So with um, um, deeper study, what we see is that the central one was the most massive one of the group. And it's already uh, approaching the end of its life because it does that much faster than the others. And by studying objects like this one, we understood that the more massive a star, the shorter its lifetime. And we discovered a, a lot of other things like that. And one thing more among the many things we can study with, uh, with the clusters, I mentioned, I mentioned it shortly before, it's uh, the distance. So they're all at the same distance. And that's very crucial because that distance can be determined quite accurately. And uh, Peter, if you can bring the next slide. Um, that provides us a way to measure distances across our own galaxy. So uh, that's an artistic impression of our own galaxy, the galaxy we live in, the Milky Way. We study tons of other galaxies that we can observe uh, from our viewpoint, but there's one galaxy we cannot see from outside and it's ours. We have to, we're condemned to be stuck on the earth ground and look at it from the inside, look at the Milky Way from the inside. The only way we have to really understand how it's uh, structured and all the distances and what, where are the, the, the different patterns in our galaxy is to measure distance to stuff. So if you click once, uh, Peter, there's an arrow showing where we are. This is the sun and the planets around. And those points mark more or less, grosso modo, I, you can keep them, yeah. Um, where we have measured uh, many of those uh, clusters that I mentioned. So having the distance to the clusters is very interesting because now we see where those stars are. We see where they tend to be uh, denser or having less of them. And when uh, we have that information, we can uh, pinpoint where the arms of our galaxy are where the star forming regions are, where all the critical structures are. Uh, in the center of the galaxy, you, you have this more yellow part. This is a patch of a uh, big group of much more yellow stars, um, much older than the rest. In the spiral, you tend to have younger blue bright stars that are being formed. And one cluster that uh, is uh, occupying a lot of my time these days is on the uh, complete other side of the galaxy. Actually, the, um, the arrow is pointing towards it, but it's literally on the other side of the galaxy compared to us. Um, the big deal with that is that it's very far from all the others we know. 
more importantly, it's on uh, the opposite opposite side of our galaxy because between uh, here and that place, there's a lot that we have to look through. It's a bit like looking through a jungle. Uh, that means it's very hard to observe, very hard to study. And having access to a group of stars, once again, that are all the same age, all at the same distance, allows us to isolate a lot of parameters that give us a lot of information about what's happening on the other side of the galaxy. I think uh, I see questions and I will try to answer them now. One question asked by uh, uh, Star, Stargazer Girl 30. What is the difference between a white dwarf and a red giant? A white dwarf and a red giant. So a white dwarf to start with. It's a very, very small star. It could be the size of, let's say, the Big Island. Um, anything like the Big Island anywhere else uh, across the world. I don't know, uh, a tall mountain or, I mean, it's, it's, it's the size of a big city or a big island. Um, and this is the result, the end result of a dead star and our sun itself in another, in another 5 billion year will eventually die and become a white dwarf. A red giant though is uh, a star that is not dead yet. It's on the way, in the process. So what's happening is that the core is contracted and the outer layers are very, very big. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very fluffy star and very cold and that's why it's red. So that's the difference between the two. And in the system we covered earlier, there was one white dwarf and one red giant, one next to another. That happens. So the red giant was is that puff star. And being puffed, that means there's a lot of material that fell on the white dwarf. That same uh, stargazer girl 30 asked another question. Um, or maybe not. Well, yes. you're, you're thinking about that. Um, a good example of a, of a red giant is Betelgeuse in Orion, the shoulder of Orion. And uh, it's been in the news lately because it's been fluctuating a lot in brightness. And uh, you can see it just after the sun goes down over in the western sky. And I was noticing just uh, last night when I looked at it that it was looking particularly bright uh, compared to the way it's looked over the last six months or so. Uh, and so it's an interesting example of a red giant star, but a star that's uh, very unstable. And uh, we can actually see that by looking at it in the sky and tracking it in the sky, its brightness. And uh, the next question was, what does the color of stars tell us? Um, the main thing that colors tell us is the temperature. So if I ask you, what is the hottest, a blue star or a red star? Yes, you're right. It's a blue star is the hottest. <laughs> so from human experience, we tend to think that red is hot and blue is cold, essentially because fire is red and because ice is blue. But when it's, um, when it's uh, about light, a blue light is much hotter than a red light. And for example, your same fire that is red is much colder than if you have like propane flame that is more blue, especially at the tip where the temperature is at the highest. So blue stars are hotter. Um, and that's the main parameter we can get from the color. And uh, the leeway to the next question being, how do we determine the age and the distance to stars? Um, so there, there, there's a, a range of techniques that can be used. When they are in a cluster, the beauty of it is that we know it's the same age for all the stars. We know it's the same distance. So we, we have lot, lot less things to investigate. Once you reduce down the things you have to constrain, you're left with distance and the amount of stuff that you have between that group of stars and yourself. Those are the two main parameters that you're left to, um, to adjust. And because we understand the evolution of stars, uh, there's a lot of models that can be used to get those two parameters. Um, I don't want to get into too much details because that will take too long. But basically, there's a lot of physics that has been developed over the course of the last centuries, and especially in the last century. And th there's a lot of different tools developed by 
um, uh, a lot of different researchers across time uh, in science history that are applied every day for finding those, uh, those parameters such as age and distance. Uh, there's a question by Thor, if I'm not wrong. How far do they have uh, to launch the artist to paint that painting of our galaxy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the artist's impressions are strongly, strongly uh, guided by science results. So if we were never using any artist's impression, all you would have are sometimes pretty images that were taken with the telescope. Sometimes we have some, but sometimes it would be just a dot. That would be an example of a pretty picture that is made possible uh, through the telescope. So there's a lot of story that can be told with those. Uh, th this is a pair of galaxy uh, that is interacting with one another. Uh, that's, that tells a lot of story and maybe Peter can tell more. I just want, before I let him do that, I can just say, if you don't have that uh, pretty, image if you have um, if you, and if you want to explain like the, that system of star and planet that I explained earlier you need someone to draw it for you so the scientists tell them make sure this is red make sure this is green make sure this is blue make sure this is round make sure this is oval and so on and so forth and the artist says I can do it and this is how this collaboration can produce the most the clearest image we can give to illustrate what we just found so our own galaxy was the, 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 the drawing of our galaxy was guided by um, all the discoveries about all the distances of different stars, different gas, different objects. Uh, and we're still, I mean, every day, one of my jobs is to improve that knowledge. So the next time an artist will have to draw our galaxy, they may have to change certain things because I found new things. Not just me, my, my, my collaborators as well, of course. Um, let me just take two minutes to mention that if you want to know how it is to uh, work at Gemini and make science possible, we created a card game that is called the Gemini card game. Uh, if you want more details about it, you can get, you can get to that web page there, www.gemini.edu slash GCG for Gemini card game, so GCG. And we made all the design available for download. You can download all the cards and you follow the recipe how to make your 90 card game um, deck. Um, you can print, uh, if you print six cards per letter paper page, um, you can have the right dimension to, to fit within a little card sleeve. I think I have one here if I can show it. So um, that's uh, the size of you know, it's not just paper. And then you, if you have card sleeves at home, you can insert them in. And then you have perfectly playable cards uh, for your game. So it's a collaborative game, up to four players to work together uh, and to uh, quote with the weather conditions to observe as many targets that will complete scientific programs for the newest discoveries. And you have only 12 rounds across a full semester to achieve that. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, there are contact information on, on the web page. And um, yeah, try it. Um, oh, instructions too with the video, correct? There's a video, there's a rule book. We try to be uh, uh, as clear as we can about how the game plays. It's a fun game. We've, we've played it more than oftentimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, after okay. you, Peter. Thank you, Andre Nikolai. And and um, at this point, uh, if there are any more questions, uh, I'd love to answer, try to answer some of the questions from from folks. So I'm not sure if Andre Nikola got to the last question we have in the chat, but from Stattergazer Girl Thirty, it said, "How do we determine the age and distance to stars?" Yeah, so I did touch base on that. I can go a little further. So um, the key here is to, to know how luminous is an object. If you know how luminous the object is, then you can use its brightness. So I use two terms here, luminosity and brightness. They are not the same thing. So let's do the uh, thought experiment. Let's take a candle and you light it. And you have 
a series of candles, they are all the same and you all light them. If they're all together in front of you, they are all the same brightness because they're all, they are all the same luminosity and all at the, the same distance of you. But if you take one and you push it further away from you, even though it's the same luminosity for the two candles, because one is further away, it will be less bright. So you can use the, the, the how dim an object is to uh, get its distance. So if you know how luminous it should be by measuring its brightness, you get the distance. Now, the challenge is to get that luminosity, how luminous is an object. It's, um, it's more than often very challenging because we can be wrong sometimes by, by a factor 100, which destroys completely your intention in getting the distance. But there are some objects that are well behaved and that allows us to get a very good constraint on, on how luminous they are. Therefore, once we see how bright they are, we can get the distance. One type is a, a type of a varying star. It's very nice because the exact shape of the change of brightness um, corresponds exactly to its luminosity. So all you have to do is to measure how it varies with time. So you take one measurement every hour, sometimes every minute because it varies very quickly. And that variation can be used to get directly the luminosity. So you know how luminous, how luminous it is, you measure how bright it is, and then that gives you the distance. That is very crucial, but there are other techniques to get uh, distance. As for the age, um, you know, if it's a red giant, it has to be at least that old because to get to that phase, you have to be a, you know, at least a certain a billion of year old to get there. Um, and, and there are different techniques like that. I think this leads well into the next question from Thor, also just added to the chat. It says, do star composition vary greatly and wouldn't that change the color? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, if you go back very early uh, in the history of the universe, um, most, if not everything, was only hydrogen, helium, and you sparkle it with a little bit of lithium. That's it. And it's the um, uh, process happening in the core of the first stars that produced all the other elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the other elements, eventually iron, and even uh, after when the first stars exploded, you could have even heavier elements like, um, like, like gold and even uh, radioactive elements like uranium and all of that. Uh, once the universe was uh, enriched by much more than just helium, hydrogen, and lithium, um, you started having some disparity across the universe. Uh, some spots had more of those elements than others. So basically, if you're uh, living in an area where there was a lot of processed material with uh, many uh, uh, generations of stars, you tend to be richer in different elements than somewhere where everything was kept uh, pretty much original. And that could change the, the color, but not just because uh, it's not directly like if you have oxygen, then you should be green. It's not that direct. It's a lot more complex than that. It's just that if you have, for instance, if you have uh, carbon and uh, nitrogen and oxygen, then stars can start being a little uh, less massive than the first stars. That is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a complex indirect impact of, uh, of uh, composition. The very first stars were hundreds to maybe a thousand times this mass of our sun in average. And most of the stars nowadays are, you know, pretty much the size of our sun. So being enriched with new elements allowed stars to be smaller and, and smaller stars tend to have different colors. So this is how composition can eventually change the color. Okay, we have another question based on the size and color of stars. And it's from Diana Marie. And she says, I'm interested in the 
Chandraskar limits and how that relates to size and color of the star? Oh, you got me here. Ah, oh, the Chandrasekhar limit. Um, in a nutshell, this is the maximum mass a dead star can have when it becomes a white dwarf. Um, basically, if I remember well from a long time ago, last time I, uh, <laughs> I worked with that concept, which yeah, a couple of years from now, um, once you are 1.4 times the mass of our sun, that, uh, is that, is that it? Anyways, that white dwarf uh, is, ha is having too much matter to be just that one compact uh, body that creates the white dwarf. Um, at, the, at the surface, you start having not so white dwarfy kind of behavior of the mat matter. Um, how does that relate to size and color of the star? It doesn't, as far as I remember, it does not relate directly to size of stars in general, but it really matters when you get to compact objects. Compact objects, to be sure it's clear, is when you, you bring so much matter in a very small volume. Our sun right now is not what we would call a compact object. It's just a big ball of gas, very, very hot. Um, it can be denser in the core, but not what we call compact. Later, in 4.5 billion years from now, the core will eventually start you know, collapsing. And collapsing means getting into a, a much smaller volume. And in 5 billion years from now, that volume will become very, very small. And all that matter will eventually be trapped in that small volume. This is where the Chandra Sekar limit is really taking into account. Okay, that's it for our questions. Pretty deep and interesting questions. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Andre Nikolai, for joining us today and uh, for joining us uh, out there on YouTube for our presentation. And um, Join us next week. Next week, we will be coming on Wednesday, uh, one o'clock Hawaii time. That would be four o'clock um, mountain time and seven o'clock Eastern time. Um, so uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Thank you. Ahoy ho.